Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about a cool mathematical object called the Jacobian. So it has one of those scary sounding names, but I promise it's not too difficult. Let's start really easy with a function of one variable. So we have f of x is equal to x squared. If I asked you to take the derivative of this guy, it should be pretty simple. We just do df dx is equal to 2x. Pretty simple. Let's go up one level, let's visit multivariable calculus where you learn that we can put not just one thing into a function, but we can put several variables into a function. So here's one example. We have f of not just x, but now it's x1 and x2. And that function is given by this guy over here. Not too difficult to extend this. Now we can call these partial derivatives instead of just derivatives. So they have this delta symbol here. And we ask about what's the derivative of that function with respect to each of its inputs. So we call it partial of f with respect to x1 is this guy, and partial of f with respect to x2 is this guy. So still nothing too crazy going on. Now the Jacobian, all it does is just extends this one level further. Because what we saw here, we still had one function total, it's just that that function was now inputting several variables. Now the Jacobian asks, what if we have several functions, each of which is a function of different variables? So here's an explicit example of that. So we have f of x1 and x2. So this notation here, by the way, is the exact same as this notation here. You can really pick either one. I just chose this notation to say that, hey, this is a function of a vector, or in other words, a function of multiple variables. So that's just a notational thing. So we have this function called f, which takes in several variables. Here are just two variables. But the, the difference here between this and this case is that this function f is really two functions. So it's a function that takes in a vector, x1 and x2, and it also outputs a vector, which is f1 of x1, x2, and f2 of x1, x2. And explicitly it's given here, that's the mathematical formulation. So let me just backtrack and make sure everyone's on the same page here. We have two variables, x1 and x2. The first thing we do is put them into this top function, f1, and we get this result here. The next thing we do is take those two variables, put them in the bottom function, and we get this result here. So that this function f, its job or its objective is to take in two variables, x1 and x2, and also output two variables, namely this guy and this guy, or f1 and f2. So now that we're all on the same page about what's going on here, what does it mean to take derivatives in this case? Well, we can just extend directly from this example because now we have two variables and two functions. So there should be two times two or four possible derivatives to get in this case. And that's exactly what's collected in this table here. Or matrix, that's probably the better way to think about it. So explicitly we have the partial of the first function, this guy, with respect to the first variable. The partial of the first function with respect to the second variable. The partial of the second function with respect to the first variable. And the partial of the second function with respect to the second variable. And we can just work them all out and it looks like this. So Hopefully I remember my calculus well enough to have that correct, but we have this two by two matrix which collects all the possible derivatives, and this two by two matrix is what's called the Jacobian. So our notation is J for Jacobian, we subscript the uh, name of the function which is F, and we explicitly put in all the variables that were used here, X1 and X2. So you'll see different notations for this guy, but the Jacobian in a nutshell is just taking all possible derivative combinations uh, based on how many functions you have and how many variables you have and collects it into this nice, neat matrix. Now that we hopefully understand what the Jacobian is, we are going to talk about the most important part of this video, which is why is the Jacobian useful in data science or stats? Of course, it's cool to look at these things, but I personally don't think that there is any value if it's purely theoretical. I think that it needs to be used for something in data science. So what is it used for in data science? The best example and the most buzzwordy one I could think of is in the context of neural networks where it's pretty important. So let's take the rest of this video and talk about that. So here's a neural network. I have a whole video on neural networks. Um, it would be good to watch that, but it's not necessary. I can walk you through what's basically going on here. So there's one input x. So to be clear here, x is just a single number. It's not a vector. So we have the single number x, and that's called our input. And some stuff is going to happen, and I'll describe that stuff to you. But at the end of the day, all that stuff leads to another single number at the end of this neural network. And that's called P. So I called it P because a lot of times you'll be using a neural network to try and figure out probabilities of some event happening. That's just one application. So we have some input X, which is one number, and we have some output P, which is another number. So our goal and everything we're about to talk about is going to be try to figure out what is DP DX. In other words, if I change X by a little bit, what is the effect that has on the final output P? 
To do that, we're going to need to better understand what goes on in the middle, because obviously we're not going directly from X to P. There's some machinery in the middle going on. So let's talk about it step by step. That's just a three-step process. The first step is that this X goes to the first hidden layer, which consists of two numbers, A1 and A2. So by the way, these plus ones are not variables. They're just uh, there to represent the bias term, which won't really even be that important to the model. I just wanted to do this justice. So the first layer is A1 and A2, which is given here. So this vector A1 and A2. A1 and A2 are both functions of a single variable x. So if you look back to the previous layer before this, the only input coming in is x. And so they're explicitly given by this, which are just linear functions of x. So to be explicit, A1 is a function of x, which looks like some coefficient times x, plus this c is just a bias or coefficient term, a constant number. A2 is also just a function of that same variable x, and it's given by this coefficient term times x plus a different bias term. Now, if I ask you what's the Jacobian of this guy, it's actually even easier than the example we did here because these are all linear functions. But let's go through it explicitly just to be sure. So if I ask you what's the Jacobian of this function here, it's a function of one variable, and it has two functions in it. So the Jacobian's dimensions are going to be two by one. It's going to be important to talk about the dimensions of the Jacobian in this process. So explicitly, how we get this first number is we take the derivative of the first function with respect to the first and only variable. So that's the derivative of this guy with respect to x. That's simply just this coefficient term here. Exact same thing for the second coefficient term here. So that's the Jacobian of the first part of the process. Now let's go to the next part of the process. So we go from the first hidden layer to the next hidden layer. A little bit more complicated. So now we have this new vector b1, b2, which are these two numbers here. And b1 and b2 are both now functions of two variables. So you know that by looking at the diagram. If you look at b1, there's two variables coming into it. If you look at b2, there's two variables coming into that. So this is the same dimensional case as we are looking at here. Two functions, two variables. Which means that the size of our Jacobian is going to be 2 by 2. And we can go through all the math. You can do the same derivative calculations, but you'll find the Jacobian in this case looks like this. So very similar to up here, where it's just collecting all these coefficient terms. So we have a 2 by 2 Jacobian here, and let's go to the last part of the process. The last part of the process is going from the second hidden layer to the final output. That's even easier than the one we just looked at, because that's just a function of two variables, and there's one function, one output, which is p. So explicitly, that looks like this. We can take the Jacobian of this step too. In this case, there is one function of two variables, so the Jacobian is going to be 1 by 2, and it looks like this. So take a minute, pause, rewind, write some stuff on a piece of paper, make sure you are convinced that these Jacobians are correct, make sure that this architecture roughly makes sense, and now let's revisit our goal, which is trying to figure out how does a small change in x, which is our input, affect the output, the final output, which is p. Now, if we weren't using Jacobians, if we were trying to do this by hand, it could get a little bit cumbersome and a little bit messy because we have to think about every possible path there is to get from x to our final output p. And in this case, there's four paths, which isn't a lot. So explicitly, those four paths are going to a1, then b1, then p, a1 to b2, then p, a2 to b1, then p, or a2 to b2 to p. So there's four paths, but you can imagine as your network gets longer, and as you get more nodes in each layer, there's going to be many, many paths. It can then be really hard to keep track of all that. And then we have to add up the results of those derivatives together in order to get our final result. Now, here is the magical part, the shortcut. If we choose to use Jacobians, we can get that same exact number, dp dx, simply by just multiplying together the three Jacobians we've collected along the way. So if we do j3 times j2 times j1, let's make sure the dimensionality is correct. So it's a 1 by 2 times a 2 by 2 times a 2 by 1. So the final result is a 1 by 1 scalar, which is exactly what we were expecting. And the awesome thing is that this scalar is exactly the result we're looking for, which is dp dx. And the intuitive way to think about it is that these Jacobians were collecting the derivatives at each part of the process. So it should make some intuitive sense that if we multiply these derivatives together, which is kind of like tracing through all the possible paths through this network, that we're going to get exactly the result that we're looking for. So this is one awesome application of Jacobians. And so they're not just a cool notational thing. They are something that gets used a lot in order for us to calculate these gradients a lot more efficiently and a lot more reliably.
So hopefully you learned about Jacobians in this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. Um, any questions in the comments below are welcome, and I will see you next time.